sets us up very nicely. Uh, again, my name is Peter Spiegel. I, I'm the Brussels Bureau Chief here, and it's a great honor to be back uh, for the second year as a moderator, as the opening moderator. I guess I did okay uh, the first time. Uh, it also so happens, I think the, the, the Brussels Forum tends to be a bit of a jinx for me. Uh, if, if those of you who were here last year remember, uh, it was in the middle of an emergency uh, meeting of Eurozone finance ministers for the Cypriot bailout uh, that I was up all night before. And uh, to the, today, I was up all night before this, uh, dealing with sanctions uh, for, uh, on Crimea. So uh, I am uh, not at my best, perhaps, but I have a very good panel here to deal with uh, the issues of transition in Europe. Uh, again, when we first started talking with the organizers about how to do this session, uh, the obvious m m topics of discussion were going to be economic malaise, demographic challenges, but suddenly geopolitics has returned to the scene. Uh, and again, we have a very good panel to deal with this. Let me do a quick introduction, uh, starting from my right, Tomas Ilves, who, uh, despite his accent, is the president of Estonia. Uh, at the center, uh, perhaps a new face to some of us here, the new Italian uh, foreign minister, Federica Mogherini. Mogherini. Um, and to my, to my immediate right, uh, someone known to, to, to many of us, uh, currently at Goldman Sachs, but former head of the World Bank, uh, and other things in various US positions, uh, Bob Zelik. Um, as the organizers have told you, I think, I hope, all of you have been handed uh, very fancy iPads uh, for something I am new to, but a rather interactive uh, element of this, of this session. So I ask you all to take it out right now because I have, hopefully, uh, queued up uh, a, a poll to start us with. Because I thought, because we are dealing with a rather amorphous topic of tr Europe in transition, uh, that we might first try to get the view of those of you in the audience about what is the biggest challenge uh, in terms of, of the transition going on in Europe right now. So can I get that called up on the screen and also to the, the devices in everyone's lap? There we go. Um, now, as you can see, I, I picked six here. They're not all obvious. The, the question is, for those of you who can't see the screen, what is the biggest challenge facing the future of Europe as Europe goes in transition? Uh, the first is a new Eurozone crisis. There are many people who argue that we're not through it yet. Uh, number two, we are in a, in a political season here in Europe. We have European elections coming in May uh, where nationalism and political populism is facing a challenge. Uh, we also, again, the geopolitical uh, element I, I, I mentioned. Uh, we see number three, uh, Russian assertiveness in, 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 in the East. The demographic challenge, number four, an aging population. Five, a weak recovery and, and relative economic decline globally in Europe. And then obviously the other geostrategic uh, challenge faced by Europe, which is in the southern border, uh, the, the Arab Spring and the fallout from that. So why don't I ask you uh, to start the poll now? I think you have 15 seconds to pick one through six. So to just pick, it's, a, it's a little artificial, but if you could pick what you believe to be the, the largest challenge facing uh, Europe as it's in transition in, in the near future. Uh, hopefully that will start us off uh, on, a, on, a, on a good note. Ambassador Chizov, I, I assume you're not going to be picking number three, but uh, <laughs> very good. And we should get our results here. Ah, oh, interesting. Interesting. Weak econ economic recovery and relative decline. Well, that, that serves me very well because the first person I wanted to call on was Mr. Zelik. Um, who obviously has a background on these issues. So let me ask you, introduce you first of all, Bob Zelik, and, and ask you to, to, uh, to address uh, the issue of, of the weak economic recovery, but also make any in, uh, introductory remarks you'd like to. Okay. Well, uh, permit me, if you will, just um, since this is Craig Kennedy's last uh, meeting as head of the GMF, I want to say a special thanks to him. I was on the board with some others here when Craig was selected, and frankly, he didn't have uh, much of an international background. I didn't know exactly how he'd fare, and I think he's done a fantastic job, in part because he had the vision, as I look around this room, taking over not long after the events of 1989 about trying to reach the transatlantic community further east, extend to the borderlands, and very importantly, and totally missing on your list, <laughs> uh, is a sense of how Europe uh, and uh, the relationship with the United States fits in the global environment. Um, China doesn't fit there at all, or East Asia doesn't fit there. And uh, I think at least uh, Craig has done a fantastic job not only in direction, but also at the human level with a lot of people. So I wanted to take a chance to thank him. Um, we were talking a little bit beforehand about this uh, topic of transition. And I'll come to the economics, but uh, you know, the challenge, particularly from a European perspective, is uh, when do you start the transition? 
So I went back and looked at what was happening uh, in Europe uh, 200 years ago this week, and the Fourth Coalition was massing on Paris, ending one vision, which was the revolutionary imperial vision of France. Uh, and at this time, about 100 years ago, we were about at the test of another vision of a German imperial view. Uh, 25 years ago, we were narrowing in just uh, for the events of 1989 and uh, the breakdown of the old order. And I want to focus on that just for a moment because um, my view at that time was that I thought the, uh, while of course the vision of, uh, would be a European one, I thought it would have a distinctly German coloration. And I viewed from the perspective of the United States that a very important relationship was the German-US relationship. And I think as a fair assessment, that's something that all parties let slip over the last 25 years. And if we think about events in Ukraine, or you think about the events of the economy, you think about events in China, it's a key aspect um, sort of going forward. Uh, and that links me to the other point. I notice it's interesting, one other element in addition to the global situation that is not on that list is the transatlantic one. Uh, is there a transatlantic dimension to these challenges. So I know it's always unfair for the panel to be able to sort of chip it, uh, the, the list they put on, but I would suggest we think about those two. Um, uh, I'll comment on the economic one, but obviously Ukraine is on everybody's mind. So let me just make a brief, brief thought on that. Uh, watching this closely, I, I think, and I even listened to the foreign minister's comments very closely about partnership with Russia. What happens in events in the international affairs or business or others is there's often critical moments where the incrementalism that guides our daily life switches to uh, bigger shifts. And I think my own view is this is one of those moments because I think Russia has fundamentally changed the post-Cold War set of norms and expectations about international behavior. And I think this is going to have ramifications. It's certainly if you're in the Baltics, if you're in... It was President Putin not only described what he did, but made a reference to Russian populations, if you're in Central Asia and others, this is going to have a lot of ramifications for a long time to come. And I think, as often happens with seismic events, it's going to take a while for people to figure this out. I am struck, however, that though much of the focus in at least the U.S. and some of the European press is on Russia, understandably, but if we're serious about this, the, press, the focus is going to have to be on Ukraine. I worked a lot with Ukraine. Uh, I visited there a number of times. I tried to get Chancellor Merkel to play a greater role with uh, uh, Timoshenko on the reform process. And the starting point is a political one, that the people of Ukraine basically have lost trust in their political class. So the starting point is going to be how you create political cohesion in Ukraine. For economics, the technical term is, it's a mess. Uh, it's going to require a huge commitment. So. For people who want, and I personally share this view, to say we have to support Ukraine's sovereignty and independence, they have to understand the economic commitment is not going to be minor and ultimately has to be based on decisions of Ukrainians. And there's one other one that I've waited. I've been asked by press all week to comment. I waited for this forum to comment on. And that is it's something I haven't heard. And that is I, I don't believe that either the U.S. or Europe is going to uh, be responsible for the physical security of Ukraine. But what if the Ukrainians decide to stand up for themselves? And what if the Ukrainians decide to fight? And what if the Ukrainians say that I would want weapons uh, to support them? The first reaction, I imagine, among most European polities will be, oh no, this fuels conflict. But does it fuel conflict? We saw this in the Balkans. If one side has arms and the other is less prepared to fight, and I, I wrap this back up. I think the key point for President Putin's view of the world is he's not going to be seriously affected by slaps on the wrists of visas or this sanction or that sanction. Although seriously, the bank sanctions could be significant if somebody really went that direction. But what he could be affected by is if he gets himself into a military mess. And that ultimately depends on the Ukrainians. But that's going to be an issue that the transatlantic community is going to face. On your last economic point, I would just say that my expectation is the Eurozone will muddle through. I think that the ECB has created a floor. It's prevented the tail risks. But as I look at the outlook of demand, I suspect that it's going to move in a rather narrow channel. And this 
makes my point about the nature of the German economy in Europe. This has been a German economic recovery with the strengths and weaknesses of that. And I think what we're now going to see is the politics of economic reform. Um, there's some bright signs in Spain, in Portugal, uh, but there's a long way to go. And the challenge, as you reference the, or others reference the populism of the parliamentary elections, will the politics of Europe be able to sustain this? My own best guess is it will, but the reason why this is important is the fundamental attribute that Europe has to bring to the table, whether it's Ukraine, or whether it's dealing with East Asia, or whether it's dealing with the Mideast, is a successful economy. Like Federica, if you could address issue number two, because obviously, uh, for those of you who don't, don't know Federica, before she was, took the, the finance, min, uh, the foreign ministry, was a, was an MP in Italy, is an is a active member of the, the Democratic Party, the center left party in Italy. But obviously, a huge challenge to the mainstream parties in Italy, but also throughout, uh, and not just southern Europe. We've seen it in the Netherlands, we've seen it in France, where, where polls now uh, for the European elections have Front National in first place, in Britain, obviously, with UKIP. What, what, what is your view on, on, on the, the issue of, of number two and whether political populism is a threat and what can mainstream parties do uh, to deal with that? Yeah, first of all, th let me uh, say that uh, I'm quite excited to be here because it's my first time at the Brussels Forum, but I was actually a German Marshall Fund fellow uh, not so long ago. Uh, six, seven years, so I can say it works probably, <laughs> and quite fast. Um, I was surprised by, can I see the results of can the... we go back to the previous slide, is that possible? Yeah, uh, I was surprised by the results that... Uh, I think it was 25 point, 27.4%. Which is the which second. Is, so it's number two. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which is surprising to me in a time when we are, uh, well, if you show that together with the European Parliament picture, it, it, it's already a statement. Um, <laughs> No, we don't have the I results. Have it. Anyway, it's surprising to me that it's a second yes, result. If I'm, I'm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the times when we are only discussing about Ukraine, uh, which says that, at least here in this room, uh, we are aware of the fact that uh, uh, we have challenges in these times of transition, which is long 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years, seven years, depending on how long period you take, uh, the, the focus changes. Uh, still, we are aware, at least in this room, that we have challenges that go uh, beyond uh, our Eastern partnership and our way to respond to uh, a breach of the legal, uh, of, of the legal framework uh, of the international relations. I share very much, and with this I close, uh, open and close the bracket on Ukraine, uh, and maybe we, we go back to that later, uh, with what my uh, Belgian colleague was saying before. Uh, we have, at the same time, to have a very strong reaction and, to our opinion, the strongest reaction is a, a united reaction from the international community on what is happening already today, the signature of the annexion uh, of, of Crimea from Russia. But at the same time, we have to ask ourselves, what is the ending point of the process we are in? What is the exit strategy, not just for Russia, but for us? Uh, as we share a certain number of dossiers, uh, economically, uh, geostrategically, around the Mediterranean, that at a certain point we have to realize how we deal with that uh, together. Because I think that one of the results of the transition of the 100 years is that we moved to a war scenario inside Europe, to the awareness of the fact that we have to deal with crises around the world. Uh, in, in a partnership dimension, not only with Russia, but also with the Far East and, and with the Mediterranean and Africa and Latin America and so on. Um, so I think we have to keep open the, 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 the way we, we are going through uh, in the long term. Uh, on populism, I don't like the term itself. Uh, I think we are suffering a, a sort of um, disillusion uh, from the European dream that we had, uh, let's say, 25, 30 years ago, maybe even 10, before the crisis. I would say before the crisis. Uh, my generation is the so-called Erasmus generation, probably. I, I did it myself, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, but we, uh, we've grown up with the dream of being just Europeans, uh, not so much Italians or Germans or, or uh, whatever. Uh, and now we're facing a time when the European elections are probably telling us that uh, we Italians are coming to Brussels and saying that uh, we're fighting the German proposals. Just 
just an example <laughs> by chance. It never happens. Really. Um, and uh, while I still feel that uh, in, in my generation and probably uh, also in the generation of the founding fathers, there is the awareness of the fact that before being Italian, I'm European. I was criticized at home because I said a sentence that uh, Italy has two capital cities, Rome and Brussels. And that is not because things are decided elsewhere. It's because we Italians also decide things in Brussels, and it's always us. And I think we are lacking uh, this, this uh, simple evidence of the fact that uh, we should have some coherence uh, between the things that we do in Rome or in Paris or in Berlin or in uh, Dublin and the things that we do and say in Brussels and the way back. This blame game that we have played, we politicians, we governments, we parliamentarians, also a little bit we journalists, I'm not a journalist, but uh, <laughs> some of you here are, uh, of saying that there, there's a gap, there's a difference, there's two different places where the people are the same. The people are the same. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, not, uh, uh, it's, it's not giving our European citizens uh, the appropriate uh, image of what is being done in, in Brussels. Uh, and then there, is, there has been a vicious circle with the crisis, I think. Maybe uh, being from the south, I've, I've seen it uh, from the south of Europe, I've seen it a little bit more, but uh, it's like, uh, I don't know if the English term is appropriate, a self-revealing uh, um, prophecy. EU doesn't work, so we do not invest in the EU. So the EU doesn't have the tools to face the problems, so the EU doesn't work. And this has been the game in the last uh, six, seven, eight years. And crossing this with the economic crisis has made Europe not delivering to its citizens. And this is at the basis of populism, what we call populism, which is just uh, the feeling that uh, decisions are not uh, appropriate to face uh, the level at which they would be needed because there's no decision that we can take at a national level anymore that can face the crisis that we are facing today. The problem is that we didn't build the tools uh, allowing us to give the appropriate response. And now the European citizens are just telling us, look, you're telling me that you do not have the tools at a national level. At the same time, you have been telling me in the last years that Europe was bad. So, wh which is the way out? So, I think that now we are at a crossroad. Either we, uh, we say, and it's not my proposal, uh, we go back, we try to go back to a national level. Uh, we refuse the global dimension. We refuse that we are interconnected. We refuse that we have to solve things together. And uh, we try a different way. We close ourselves into our small or big countries. Uh, I don't see it even realistic and feasible uh, in any way, but it is a temptation somewhere. In Italy, there are some parties that are arguing that. Uh, or we do what we haven't done in the last 10 years. We build efficient and real European instruments, tools, to take decisions together at the right level, which is the European level at the minimum, I think, uh, to face uh, all of it, the economic situation, even the uh, foreign affairs uh, problems we have, because Lisbon Treaty is giving us tools on foreign affairs policy that we are not using, not all of them, on the defense. We have instruments that we could put in place if we wanted to. The point is, do we want to get to detrustation from a European Union that is uh, somehow playing the blame game to a European Union that takes responsibilities and try to do what it's supposed to do, deliver answers to our citizens. And this is going to be uh, both on the economic side and also on the, on the international side. If you look east to Ukraine, not only to Ukraine, if you look south, uh, Libya, Egypt, uh, Middle East, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Iran, I can go on. We have a role to play. We live in the center of the most problematic, challenging, exciting part of the world, full of opportunities, full of risks. We have plenty of work to do if we just put the political will and energy to do that. So, 
a very optimistic outlook. You're an honorary American now. So uh, <laughs> uh, it's funny. I think all those things you've touched on, uh, touch on, on, on political leadership, which is a topic I'd like to explore also. But let me first turn to you, President Ilvis. And, and, and number three on the list uh, with 15% was the issue of, of Ukraine and Russian assertiveness in the East. Obviously, something that is very near and dear to your heart uh, <laughs> as, a, as a former Soviet Republic. Let me ask you if you could address We're not that a number three Sovi We're not a and, uh, Sovi and, and, and anything else you'd like to, to, to touch on. Well, I would, I would, I would now provide the dystopian alternative what the minister <laughs> provided. I would say what the best, or the response of Europe to the crisis in Ukraine shows that uh, Robert Kagan was completely off when he said that Americans are from Mars and Europeans from Venus. I would say Americans are from Mars and Europeans from Pluto. Uh, and I mean that in the sense of plutocracy. If we look at the response of Europe to what is a, I mean, clearly to everyone, a complete and utter collapse of the fundamental assumptions of security <laughs> in the post-World War II order, non-inviolability of borders, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> internal <laughs> interference, aggression, all of those things have just disappeared and we are doing nothing about it in Europe because let's face it, what they agreed upon is really kind of piddly because everyone says, oh, we have banks there. Oh, if we have that, we're not going to, this is not going to be a financial center anymore. Oh, we're just, we have too many contracts. So what ends up happening to be agreed upon is you figure, you pull out a couple of people say that they're bad, and that's all we're going to do, and, uh, and, it's, a, and it's a slap on the wrist. Uh, well, without really understanding that what has happened, and, and I think that uh, Bob Zellick already pointed this out, this is a fundamental reordering of, of how life is going to be in Europe. You know, the 75, uh, 1975 Helsinki final conclusions stopped having any meaning after Georgia was was attacked in 2008, but what did Europe do then? For a month, we had uh, we had a kind of a kind of sanctions. Um, we had a set of principles that had to be met um, that were set by the president of France. And then a month later, when those principles were not met, the president of France said, "Thank God." Good sense prevailed, and we did away with the principles that I had presented before. Uh, now, so. I mean, I would say that Georgia was the wake-up call, and we've been and we've been hitting the snooze button ever since then. Uh, and now, now having arrived six years later to the Ukraine, we are faced with what is an inevitable progression from aggression against Ukraine to aggression and border change in legalized border change. It was just signed a few hours ago by the president of Russia um, in Europe. Uh, and I, what does that mean for Europe? I would say a, a, a major loss of trust in Europe as a player in common foreign security policy. Um, because, it, you know, okay, we can do the, the little stuff, but we won't do the big stuff. And the other thing concomitant to that, I think, is the end of the uh, Lugar idea for NATO of out of area or out of business. The, it's today, it's back in area and back in business. We are dealing with Article 5. We are dealing with the defense of the alliance. We are not looking for any more monsters abroad to slay. We are... We are in Europe, making sure no monsters come to Europe. So this is, these are big changes, and I think we are working them out, and I think the change in the world today requires its Mr. X, its, its George Kennan to write the article, because this, the old rules, or the rules of the post-Cold post War period, that started in 89, fundamentally ended in 2014. That's a quarter century, that's a pretty long-lasting era, but we have to think of things differently because when we say the fundamental assumptions have changed, that means that we cannot, we can no longer think that there, is, there are unthinkables of a certain type. Countries do get invaded, countries do get occupied. Fake referenda are held. Um, we've seen it before. 
uh, we thought that the era of the Sudetenland argument was gone forever. It's not. It's back. We thought the idea, especially wonderful in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, of having a foreign military occupation, then holding holding elections with 99.7%. Uh, we outdid in Estonia in 1940 the Crimeans because we got 4% more, 99.7, uh, voting to shoot ourselves. Um, we see that sort of the things we hated most about the 20th century, that Europe was designed to say, never again, Europe is sitting here and watching it happen and saying, there are 21 persons who can't come visit us anymore. I don't think that's really an appropriate response. Um, and I see that NATO is being revitalized, and I think this will revitalize the transatlantic relationship. But it's not just the evils of the 20th century. I think we have to come to terms with the fact that we have been living already for, since even before the collapse of the wall in a postmodernist era. Uh, and we love our Derrida. Um, but we are looking at a country with nuclear weapons that has gone back to its 19th century uh, fundamentals of Tsar Nicholas I where the, the pillars of a country are orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. That was what, the, in the first half of the 19th century, the Russian czar saw as the pillar of Russia. And whatever, I mean, I don't dispute that, but I think we have to recognize that this is what we're dealing with. And any speech you look at, especially the speech made uh, the other day by the president of the Russian Federation, it consists almost primarily of those ideas, including all the things related to nation, use, use of nationality, justify aggression, and so forth, uh, through autocratic means, and having, having your troops blessed by orthodox priests uh, when, they are, when they are surrounding on foreign territory the army of that foreign country, as we saw with the orthodox priests blessing the, the soldiers without insignia who were besieging the Ukrainian bases on Ukrainian soil. So, I hope we get a Mr. X writing soon uh, on what the, what the new world order looks like. I mean, I haven't touched upon China and I haven't talk, talked about the rise of Asia economically and so forth, but I think that in Europe today, we are faced with a, such a new and radically different security uh, situation that the, cur the position of sanctioning someone is not really enough. I mean, I think I get the feeling at least that, okay, we sanction them and then the next meeting we'll see if we sanction some more. And if we don't have to sanction some more, then in four weeks we can say, thank God common sense prevailed and we will let and we will then concede the status quo to where it is, just as we conceded the status quo to the occupation of Abhazia and South Ossetia. And no one really makes a big deal out of it today, even though there was was part of the four-point plan of, of President Sarkozy that it should have been resolved already in 2008. So I'm actually fairly depressed. I am, on the other hand, haven't been this optimistic about transatlantic relations in <laughs> years. Um, and so with that, I'll, I mean, I focus really on only one issue, but I think that's the way it's going, at least viewed from Tallinn. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I am going to abuse uh, the, the chairman's prerogative because when I came out here today, I happened to see uh, Ambassador Chizov sitting to my seat across from me. For those of you who don't know, Ambassador Chizov is the Russian ambassador to the European Union. And I passed him a note to, to ask if it was okay to call on him for, for the first question. And so can I get the microphone from Ambassador Chizov uh, for a question? Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the attention to my humble person. Uh, Listening to the debate here, I couldn't escape the feeling that the topic, the substance, is somewhat misplaced. What I think should be of concern to us all here, both Europeans and Americans, is not what you refer to as Russian assertiveness, but what we may be facing in the nearest future in the middle of Europe. Please, my Ukrainian friends, forgive me, but we see a clear danger 
of a failed state. The problem is not, the problem is not uh, between Russia and Ukraine. The problem is the deep internal political and, of course, economic crisis within Ukraine. So, uh, what, and you know, the, the overall discussions have shifted uh, in recent days to what was happening in, in Crimea. And I think it was basically systemically wrong because the events in Crimea were a spin-off of the crisis in Ukraine. And what Russia did in Crimea was in response to th uh, that spin-off of the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, so my question would be to all panelists how they view the immediate perspective and the longer term perspective. What could we jointly do to escape uh, this type of development uh, regarding Ukraine? Thank you. But before I get that, let me just actually try to get that back to the panel. And, and, and uh, yeah. Mr. Zelik, you said you well, wanted to... Well, Ambassador, I, I really appreciate the way you frame this, because I think that's a very honest framing of the issue uh, from the Russian perspective. And, um, and you know, just to connect this with recent events, there's a lot of speculation about what President Putin had planned. My own assumption is there was a strategic context here where he wanted to sort of recreate a Eurasian Union, and there were various policies that I wasn't comfortable with, with uh, some of the economic issues with Azerbaijan and, and uh, even with Kazakhstan and Ukraine. But I personally think what happened was when uh, Yanukovych, who I don't think President Putin had great regard for one way or the other, uh, basically lost control of the situation and uh, was trying to bargain between the European Union, who frankly was acting as if this was just another association agreement and missing the strategic context and bargaining with Russia, that Yanukovych cut the easy deal, what he thought, and the public reacted against it. And frankly, I think what probably set President, President Putin off is that after the EU foreign ministers came in and worked out the deal and the square rejected it, that from President Putin's perspective, this looked like chaos. It looked like the West wouldn't stick with the deal. It looked like people were under-recognizing Russia's interests. And so, damn it, he was going to make sure that people recognized Russia wasn't just going to roll over. Okay? So, and I think that's reflective in your comment about how Ukraine drives this and my comment about from the West, if we disagree with this approach, how we better be serious about helping them politically, economically, and I would add in security terms, which you probably wouldn't agree with. Not that we're going to defend them, but, but that they, if they decide to defend themselves as a neutral state, one should do that. I think, however, where the problem has expanded is that I think the West would have been quite willing to try to work with the Ukrainian polity, recognizing this is a fluid thing, and sort of make sure that there was autonomy for Russian speakers without having an invasion that then led to a false independence movement and then a annexation. And I think the, the problem now is that the way that President Putin has talked about this with the protection of Russians outside, if you're in the Baltic states, you know, remember Kaliningrad right outside Poland, okay? So if you're the west part of Poland, um, if you're uh, uh, in Moldova and you've got Transnistria, where the 14th Army always kept 1,500 troops and they've just petitioned to come part of Russia and the threat that that would pose for Ukraine on the West, this looks a lot more dangerous now. And so, um, but I think what you've done a good service here is explaining part of the Russian sort of connection uh, with the uncertainty of Ukraine. I think, you know, many of us would feel that the annexation of, of Crimea will further destabilize Ukraine. And there's a deep worry about what's happening with various operations in the eastern part of Ukraine sort of going forward. But the full answer to your question would be, I think it's incumbent on people who want Ukraine to be sovereign and independent to try to help them get their political act together and get their economic act together. And at least my view has always been that the idea that Ukraine can be detached from Russia ignores history and geography. There always had to be a place for Ukraine, in my view, with Europe, but also uh, with Russia going forward. What I frankly am very worried about is, however it happened, 
As I said, I think President Putin has changed the norms of behavior, and that's going to have shockwaves. But a lot depends on other actions going forward. And we heard a little bit here from the minister is that, you know, uh, you talk about the Erasmus generation. You know, in some ways, the Erasmus generation has been very damn lucky. You know, you grew up in an environment where you didn't have to worry about security threats, and now you will. And you're going to have to think about that in a more serious way because, you know, the answer that we all have to come together in a community and to me sounds like least common denominator policy making and I've never seen that work too well. Ms. McGregor, can I ask you to respond to that? Because you were obviously in the room on Monday when all the finance, foreign ministers actually discussed this very topic. Yeah, uh, and first of all, let me react on that because my generation had to face 9-11. And that was a security threat. And it's strange that I have to remember you. Pardon the memory. Uh, I think 9-11 was an attack ah, on the United it's a States. Different, yeah, but we had some in Europe as well. Not that, that big, but some challenges. It's just that the security challenges have changed over the decades. For good, for bad, difficult to say. They're just different. Uh, and that is why, as far as I understand, in the last decades, we have developed an idea of a uh, transatlantic relation based on building together partnership uh, with other countries, with other uh, partners in the different parts of the world to prevent threats that are not geographically identified. And do you think you can have a partnership with a country who's a, a who have invaded another one in an Not at all. Not at all. In fact, on Monday, in the, in the room of the council, well, Cathy was there as well, for sure, <laughs> uh, we decided all together, all together, unanimity, uh, of the reaction uh, to have. And I have to say that uh, I said before that we are not using all the instruments we have uh, for having a European policy in many sectors. I think that on the crisis on, on Ukraine, uh, the European Union reaction uh, was good, not in itself alone, but because uh, we had been networking with different levels, European Union, NATO, G eight, as long as the eight was there, and then G7, uh, OSCE, uh, Council of Europe, all different kinds of forum, to try and have a common approach, and it worked so far, because the sanctions we decided on Monday were very much in line with the sanctions decided in Washington, were very much in line with the fact that we decided to, have a, to convene a G7 on the Hague uh, on Monday. Uh, we are coordinating our reaction, and I think that is part of a success story in terms of foreign policy reaction from the West. Uh, we are going to have a NATO ministerial in 10 days, and we are sharing the same approach in different forums with different instruments. Is it going to be enough? I don't know. I think we have to ask to the Russian ambassador. But, but, uh, let me say a couple of other things. One more thing. Uh, US is from Mars, EU is from Pluto. Uh, I will surprise you. Italy is one of the countries that are uh, more uh, relying on uh, Russian uh, energy. Italy can do without. Italy can do without. Can Ukraine do without? That is the question. What is the best for Ukraine? Uh, don't we have also the responsibility not only to support Ukraine in terms of economic situation, because we know it's quite critical, not only in terms of political development, because the European Union, before I became minister, uh, one month and a half ago, uh, signed uh, through the three ministers that were in Kiev uh, in the middle of the crisis, uh, an agreement that was foreseeing uh, a series of uh, steps, including elections, including um, a series of measures that can help Ukraine to deal with the internal very complex situation of the country in an appropriate way. We have to support that process and we have to support Ukraine in building a sustainable uh, neighborhood policy. Uh, Ukraine is in the middle of a region. It has to deal with that and we have to work for helping Ukraine to deal with the neighbors it has. The minister asks, can the Ukraine uh, uh, deal with it? And uh, we have also have the great good fortune here can at the... Oh, would you like to respond as well? Yes, yeah, please I go mean, ahead. Okay. I mean, I, yes, absolutely. I, mean, I, I like the argumentation. First, <laughs> you we, started de we destabilize a country and then express concern that it's a failed state. Right? Uh, I mean, why? Is, I mean, if it becomes a failed state, why has it become a failed state? Uh, 
So I think that it's a little, it's a bit disingenuous. I would say that in fact, but to respond here, I would say that we can say all we want, and we do all the time, and uh, uh, that you know, the European Union is doing a great job, but in fact people vote with their feet, or they vote with their, I mean, I would say a lot of countries right now have decided that we really better focus on NATO because the EU is not going to take serious decisions on this issue, and I would dispute that. And then I don't think the decisions that were made really went very far. Uh, I think they were sort of a minimum, but in terms of, I mean, if you look at the Russian response, they simply laughed at it. They laughed at what, what the EU did, and we also, I mean, I also know what went on. And so let's bomb Russia. What is the solution then? Sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Well, I would Sorry. certainly say, I mean, we're basically say, giving a minor slap on the wrist and saying everything is wonderful as soon as we forget this little event of an annexation. I don't see that we can continue the way we are continue. We have worked up hitherto now. You know, the whole the standard lines. Let's keep all the doors open. Let's go back to business as usual. There is no business in, as usual after a country has, part of a country has been annexed by another country country. It is a new ball game. There is no business as usual, but there is Obama saying we have to find a solution that is not a military solution, and that is reasonable for Europe and for Estonia. Well, I'm not saying we need to go uh, invade sorry, anyone. I'm All I'm saying is that we better start defending ourselves, because <laughs> once you start going in this direction, I mean, what possible intellectual reason could you say this won't continue? Minister, let me ask you a question on this, and I think everybody in this room would probably agree that neither the United States nor Europe are actually going to use physical force to defend Ukraine. But let's say the Ukrainians are successful in putting together some political cohesion. And let's say the Ukrainian army says, we are going to stand up to invaders. And let's say the Ukrainian army says, however, we're going to need arms and supplies. Would you as Italian's foreign minister support that? <laughs> Welcome to the job. She's been in the job for a month. So I, would, I, I put you no, in an unfair I, position. You have to, but, no. but I think these are the sort of no, the, no, the reason I'm raising is these. It's not a difficult position. Before coming here, I was in the NATO headquarters talking to Rasmussen about this, and we're having a ministerial in one week, and I think that we are all working. The, the countries that, as Italy, are members of the European Union, NATO, G8, we're all working to try not to get there. We're not. We're trying to avoid that, and I think the U.S. is doing exactly the same. Well, I'm not commenting on the genius of U.S. policy, but uh, <laughs> I, would, I, would just, I, I would just suggest that these, and I'm not actually, I'm not trying to be critical, I'm saying if you believe that this is one of these big shifts, this type of uncomfortable question is very likely to be the types of question that you may have to face, depending on what Ukrainians do, okay? And, and my only other observation, you know, just, and this reflects just a different, slightly experience, you, you can talk about processes and meetings and so on and so forth, but at the end of the day, it will depend on what are the actions that come from those. So Philip started out with some wonderful quotes, uh, and here's a quote for you. Edison said, vision without execution is hallucination. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of European visions, but I think this is one of those moments, and I'm saying this in all seriousness. I mean, I don't think these are easy questions. I think they will depend on what happens in Ukraine, what happens in Russia. Clearly, there's going to be a pressure to think about how one defends NATO partners like the Balts, and I don't no, think... Send, and yeah. I don't think... I know, but sending F-16s may not be enough in an environment where people will move very quickly into a country. You may have to have a different view of that. So I'm saying... I just based on experience, what I'm people understandably work within certain frameworks. I think the framework has changed, and so the questions you ask and how you think about them need to be different. Just my sense. Let me try to. I want to. I don't want to spend all our time on Ukraine, but I, I, we have the great thing about the Brussels Forum is we have other voices that are quite relevant to this. And, and I've just been introduced to Vasil Filipchik, who is the political director of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the Ukraine. So can you please uh, address us? Thank you. I used to be political director. Now I work for International Center of Policy Studies in Kiev. I had to leave the government one year ago, and I, I was privileged to work with Ambassador Chizhou uh, a long time. Uh, in Brussels, and I sincerely respect you as outstanding personality and amazing speaker and very skillful diplomat, but Ambassador, dear, you are lying. You are calling white as black and black as white. It's you, it's your country, not you personally, but your country, which was 
pressing Ukraine to fail. Just remember what was one year ago. It was not a perfect country, but it was absolutely stable. There was no single element of what you call as a failing state. But you, your country, started to make trade war, uh, blocking uh, our exports, saying if you sign association agreement, innocent agreement, you would make uh, full isolation of our trade. It was your president who was declaring that we are not independent people, but we are the same people as Russians. It was your uh, advisor of President Mr. Glazyev who was coming to Yalta conference saying, it's all it's ours, it's all what, what we built. It's your president who was forcing Yanukovych to refuse signature of session agreement and buying him as, as, as a co on, on, on market, giving uh, more money if you uh, don't sign agreement, I will pay you more. It's your president and your prime minister uh, when people uh, obviously uh, disagreed with the decision of Yanukovych and went to the streets. It's your country which was encouraging Yanukovych to, make, to use force against uh, protesters. And it's your country which just used transition, uh, which, which obviously took place after Yanukovych was thrown away, to uh, uh, attack Ukraine. Uh, we never would expect that such kind of uh, close nation as you just made military aggression horrible military aggression against Ukraine. If you compare what is now in Crimea, it's exactly what was in Ukraine two uh, months ago when people were killed, kidnapped. It's, it's your style, it's your policy what we should do against Ukraine. And I think we have just clearly to recognize that there are three simple points why it all happened. First, because Ukraine is weak and Russia thinks they can just destroy us. Because Russia thinks Europe and the West are afraid and they can just ignore you. And Russia is too strong, too rich, too powerful, and they can enjoy impunity. And if we want to settle this uh, conflict, we have first to help Ukraine to become a really strong state. We have to find a way how West, US, NATO, EU, have, uh, find adequate response to Russian aggressiveness. And finally, to let them feel it will not be uh, impune. It must be something of higher level than this helpless and hopeless uh, sanctions which you adopted today. They have zero, zero, zero influence in Russia. It must be something like they violated uh, global order. They have no right anymore to be an UN Security Council permanent seat. Let's make UN General Assembly and declare that Russia has no right anymore to be at UN uh, Council seat. They have no right to be in Council of Europe. Their membership must be suspended. There are plenty of other things which we must do to stop this aggression. If we don't do it today, tomorrow they will attack Odessa, Donetsk, and they will enjoy their impunity. One more voice. Sorry, Ambassador. I still respect you. If I could, w one more voice I'd like to pull out from the audience again and saw across the way, uh, President Saakashvili. Uh, the, President Ilves mentioned the 2008 Georgia War. I think you are familiar with that. Uh, I wonder if you could, could give us your view of, you, do you recognize uh, the, the state of affairs that, uh, that Mr. Ilves talked about? Well, the, uh, <coughs> thank you. Um, first of all, uh, with all due respect to previous Ukrainian speaker, I have no respect for Ambassador Chizhov. He reminds me of a uh, character from Doc Dr. Strangelove, all those of you who remember that old movie about Cold War. Um, and the reality is that uh, back in 2008, uh, we had exactly similar situation. We had unidentified troops that were clearly unidentifiable, uh, identifiable, and Matt Bryza is here, he remembers that as Russian Special Forces, sitting on the hill around Skin Valley, shelling the peacekeepers, shelling peaceful population, killing Georgian officers, uh, several of them were killed, uh, killing lots of peaceful civilians, blowing up villages. And after weeks of weeks of this campaign, Georgia reacted, and then many of the people said, well, Georgia attacked and Russia responded. And this narrative was itself shameful. I tried to alert the whole Western community. Uh, there were people who got it right. I remember uh, Carl Bildt was there and members were, I mean, he was the one of the more many people, or uh, Mike Turner, who understood what happened, or uh, Dick Holbrook, who came and uh, was sitting all the way on the roof of the main hotel there and talking to any television in the world to explain the truth because they uh, pre predicted it, and um, uh, President Hill was coming and standing with us at the moment when Putin basically managed to bomb the rally. But, uh, but, uh, but then the European Union brought together a commission, Taliamini Commission, 
Um, and they had German ex legal experts on that commission that said, yes, this is true that Russian troops invaded Georgia prior to uh, Georgians responded, but technically it was not an aggression. And so the whole thing was triggered by large scale, uh, by the Georgian actor, uh, uh, action. And that's exactly the moment when you said, let's go to business back as usual. Now, the problem is that the same legal German expert came second day and said, well, by the way, we should recognize European Union independence of uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Brilliant expert. This is this kind of people that were making EU, EU policy or absence or covering up for absence of EU policy. But the problem with this, what happened there, is when, when you talk about Ukraine, you talk about energy. You know that, by the way, I don't know, Minister, whether you know, but Russia has just taken away the last Ukrainian hope for energy independence, shale gas. 80% of shale gas is in Crimea. We were talking about 50 to 60 billion. Russians know what they were grabbing. Russians knew exactly. It's like, uh, energy-wise, for our region, it's like Iraq grabbing Kuwait. It's hugely energetically rich Crimea. And shale gas was, with shale gas, Russia was losing the main import, importer of Russian gas in Europe. And Europe has just lost, congratulations, one of the main potential suppliers of gas to Europe. It's not about Ukraine having independence, it's about what you lost. So what we are talking about here is that when we talk about interdependence, or interdependence now it works only one way here. Because when you, have auto, when you have electoral government on the one side that has to take care of corporations, that has to fight over every percent, and on the other side of the vote, and on the other side you have authorized, uh, autocratic centralized government, they don't care about independence. They use independence as a weapon, interdependence as a weapon. And so the last thing I want to say, um, and what can be done? Lots of things can be done besides, of course, helping the Ukrainian army. I think um, uh, uh, there, are, there are, first of all, banking, uh, and I agree with uh, President Zolik, and that's my question is uh, what he thinks about that, uh, about further, uh, further um, sanctions. And I mean, Putin's circle is very vulnerable because he wants to uh, attack like Stalin, but live like uh, Trump, Rockefeller, whoever, I mean, he, uh, Buffett. Uh, he, or in a luxury way. He, he is very vulnerable and his circle is very vulnerable. But for that, you have need to do real stuff. To go, first of all, after his personal money, which everybody knows where it is. Second, Russian currency reserves. If, and I don't know whether it's visible, but the Americans have done it after hostage crisis in Iran. If Russian currency reserves that are in euros and, um, and uh, dollars, which is to say Federal Reserve and um, the European Central Bank have access to them and have, can block them, are frozen, not taken away, frozen for the moment until like Vladimir Putin is still around or still keeps his policy. For me, it's the same. Until this guy is around, he will keep his policy. Then, if it's doable. Otherwise, it's, it took six years before, less than six years before Georgian Crimea. I predicted, and many of you are here accurately, that Crimea would be next. Now it's the same bad. Uh, Moldovans or, uh, would be the best but next because there's a problem now in Gagauzia, uh, but some others. But these periods when he strikes a gate will get shorter and shorter. Appeasement, that's the problem with appeasement. You can talk as much as you want, but you know, this thing is recorded and you'll see in one or two years, even if this doesn't continue now, which might also happen, he strikes again, we might be just a little bit uncomfortable about what we were saying now, you know, Russia is a power, we should respect it. The problem is just go on, on, over and over again. And by the way, Baltic countries, Narva, what if there is like uprising of Russian population of Narva? And then people say here, oh, is it Article 5 or not? Or is it really, did Estonians really provoke it or not? Well, but these are peaceful population. They want, maybe they, they want to be with Russia. What about Riga, Russian city? What about many other places? What, by the way, uh, about Alaska? Let's okay. not get into that right I don't want, I don't want to scare uh, you. I know, no, no, I know you are scared, scared enough, no, uh, no, President, no, but. No, no President, <laughs> I will just say, let's not get into that red herring. I really don't see Russians in Estonia uh, going for free movement of labor to Siberia. I don't see them picking the ruble over the euro. Uh, you know, I don't see wanting to apply for visas that they won't get in the future to Russia, I mean, from Russia to Europe. I'm not worried, and let's not raise this red herring. Herring, please. Okay, I, 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 but excuse me, I know many Crimeans personally. These people either didn't want to be in Gulag, they live in a very sun sh sh shine place in uh, Ukraine. The, the problem there is that there are lots of Russian speakers in Ukraine who want to be in Ukraine. Did anybody really ask them? Do you really take, think that this referendum was about asking them? Nobody asked them. There was a poll conducted prior to every event, and my grandfriend knows it, where majority of Crimeans said they wanted to stay in Ukraine, or the biggest number. So it's not that they were asked. Russians never really ask. 
They ask the way how they used to ask Estonians before. So anyway, so that's I, my question is about currency reserves. What can be done about that? Let me let me let me before I go back to the panel because I'm I'm very happy to spend the rest of the the, the panel on 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 Crimea. But let me ask the 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 organizers to put up my my last poll question because it might give us a chance to talk about something else. But I'm certainly not uh, obligated to do it. This is this is again trying to to, to play on our, my first question, which is. What does Europe need to do in the near term to deal with its challenges? Um, you know, number one is what you hear a lot of here in Brussels, which is, is further political integration on a European level here in Brussels. Two, I, and I think the foreign minister mentioned, touched on this, the issue, do we just need stronger political leadership? Is the issue uh, one of leadership rather than a policies? Number three is more an economic issue. This is the, 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 the argument during the Eurozone crisis that in order for Europe to function better, we need some sort of mutualization of debt and fiscal transfers within the Eurozone. Uh, or four, is it, is it uh, a much more a German policy, which is more fiscal discipline, structural reforms that pr uh, produce economic growth. Number five, is it improved collective security? Is it through NATO or through the EU where there is more collective security to deal with these geostrategic threats? Um, or, and number six is, is what some of the populist parties have argued, which is more devolution of powers away from Brussels to the member states. I ask you to pick up your, your panels again and we'll do another 15 seconds starting now. Stronger political leadership. That's just what I wanted. Okay, let me let me turn it back to the panel and and ask you again if you could. I would encourage you to address this issue of political leadership. Don't feel obligated if you want to uh, deal with the with 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 the issues that we've been talking about on, on Crimea. Obviously, you can as well. But <laughs> President Elvis, let me start with you as, as the only head of state on our on our on our panel. Uh, what I hear frequently when I talk to voters as a reporter is this issue. Where are our leaders in Europe uh, at, at a time of crisis? This was mostly during the Eurozone crisis, but obviously we're at a time of, of, of geopolitical crisis now. Do you agree with this? Do you think we're, we're lacking in strong political leadership uh, at a time of crisis? Well, actually, I, I think it's getting better. I think that uh the Bundeskanzlerin has actually done a superb job, and though maybe some countries that weren't really following the rules are a little annoyed, uh, we're not. You know, if you actually follow the rules you've agreed to, then I'm actually glad that, the, the, that Angela Merkel has stood up for following the rules to which we have all signed on. So there, she, I think, has exhibited very good leadership there, and I think that on this issue, on on these, on this issue right now, we see I think Germany actually moving quite a bit away from simply being a money-making machine. I think that the the speech of the uh, of the president uh, in Munich last month was a uh, watershed, and I hope that. I'm hoping that the Germans follow <laughs> the speech and do take a more responsible role. So I don't think that's a problem. I also think that, in fact, there is a quite a bit of decent leadership um, which hasn't been recognized enough by countries such as Poland. I mean, we, we're still referring to Poland as a new member 10 years after the, uh, the accession of Poland uh, to the EU. No one called the neutral accession 10 years after anyone a new member. There's no new Finland, you know. But, uh, but I think that Poland has actually exhibited quite a bit of responsibility. So I think that this idea that there's no leadership is, is kind of... A, it's, it's more of a concern that not one of our guys isn't the leader. <laughs> Madam Minister, can I ask you to address the same question? And also this, this interesting argument, which, which has come up in the last six months or so, at least since the new German government has come in, into play, of, of whether there should be a new German assertiveness in foreign policy. Is that something you think that Italy would be comfortable with? And, and, and do you think political leadership is something that we are lacking uh, in, in a time of transition? Uh, I think yes. And I think we are lacking uh, mainly a European political leadership. We might have good leadership at home. We can discuss about Italy for a long time, I think. <laughs> uh, but I, don't, I, I guess it's not that interesting today. Uh, we are lacking a common European leadership. We're lacking a, leadership, a political leadership that has a European vision, that takes the European responsibility altogether, uh, that doesn't play this blame game that I was mentioning uh, before. Um, and that is, I think, what has been lacking uh, so far, uh, and hopefully it's going to, to come if we are actually in a transition that leads us somewhere. Uh, my answers would have been, but we don't have <laughs> the chance of contributing to that, uh, that uh, 
what we are uh, needing most is political integration. Uh, because I think that we have done f many steps on many issues, uh, leaving uh, ourselves the freedom of not taking the responsibilities of what we do in Brussels once we go back home. Uh, and the other answer uh, for me, the number two, and here I think I would surprise you being an Italian, uh, is the fiscal discipline and structural reforms. Uh, it's exactly what we're trying to do now with, an, with our new government, but the previous one was trying to do the same in the few months it, it, has, uh, um, it has worked. Uh, trying to keep to the rules that we ourselves have decided. I share that very much. I agree that very much. It's not something that Brussels asked us. Uh, it's our decision to do that because we believed it was right to do that. And because we believe it's useful for our own country to, to stick to the rules. We have a problem with that. We have to face it not for European sake, but for Italian sake. Uh, for my children, I would say, if it's not uh, too rhetorical. Uh, but together with that, uh, we have to do some structural reforms, at least in some countries, uh, that allows us to uh, make it sustainable in the medium or long term uh, to have a little bit of economic growth and recovery. Uh, it's a difficult exercise for some of the European countries, but I think it's the only way we have in front of us uh, to take the two things together, uh, fiscal discipline and structural reforms that can lead us to put some money in investments that can make the machine move again and the internal market and the internal demand uh, working more. But first, the political integration. If you don't have the political integration, even a strong political European leadership can't really do. And Mr. Zell, can I ask you to, ask, to answer the same question? Because obviously, having spent quite a bit of time in my own career in, in Washington, the, the, the question of, of European leadership goes even before Henry Kissinger's famous question about who do you call when you call Europe. If you could address that, but also please don't, if you couldn't uh, remember uh, President Saakashvili's question about whether foreign currency reserves and, and the Fed's and the ECB's power over them is, is, is a potential sanction uh, yeah. option. I'll try to connect those two together. Uh, and your challenge as a moderator in some ways is a good uh, example of for the minister and the president about the nature of of government policy making and actually a comment on Europe in that events take control and in this case you have dutifully tried to come across a broader set of topics but events have taken control and the reason why that's actually relevant to your bigger topic is uh, in European meetings given processes and others the immediate will drive out the anticipatory and the preparatory. So, you know, if, if I were going to give you a geopolitical view, I would at least put China and East Asia in there. And yet those will probably rarely be on an Asia, uh, a European discussion because they're being driven out by other topics. Um, on the uh, uh, President Chalakasvili's question about the economics, on this one, I, uh, maybe provide a service of just basically providing some facts. First off, uh, Russia is still primarily an energy play. If you look at Russia's GDP, about a third of the GDP is represented by the energy sector or investment in the energy sector. And last year, about a half of Russia's growth came from energy. Uh, and as the minister mentioned, this is a big question for Europe, and, or, you know, either for the immediate point or the future in terms of being able to uh, be prepared to whether that is a point of leverage. Um, and Russia's energy sector needs more investment. Um, they've been basically drawing out from the past, and that's a, that's a point of leverage on both sides. The Russian import-export market I don't think is too significant. What I would expand your observation to is it's the banking system more generally. And in this, at least I, I, I didn't get to follow this too closely, but the, I saw in the papers today that the U.S. sanctions focused on one of the Russian banks. I think that was a signal because... Um, where, where the U.S. and Europe with the dollar and the clearing could really have an effect is on shutting down the major Russian banks' use of dollar clearing, basically the way one used the Iran set of financial sanctions. Um, and because of the nature of the major Russian banks being reliant on a lot of non-deposit financing, and the fact that a lot of the Russian industrial enterprises are more leveraged than they are in the U.S. and Europe, this could be quite a squeeze. Now, is it a squeeze enough for President Putin, who would probably say, look, we went through Stalingrad, I think we can uh, live through this? 
very serious question. And what I bring to people's attention, because again, you know, these are, I think, the questions people are going to be facing. Juan Zarati, who was the member of the Treasury Department who actually put a lot of the Iran sanctions in place, and Hussein is pretty tough on this. He wrote a pretty, very interesting op-ed, and he said, if you go this way with Russia, recognize it's not easily turned back, and it kind of cuts against the 25-year effort you've had to integrate Russia into the world economy, including for a post-Putin generation, you know, the, the consumer class that's developing. So those aren't easy questions. To connect it to leadership, uh, I started out by making the point that, you know, there were some false starts by Germany 100 years ago. We, 25 years ago, it was my strategic view that Germany would be the coloration of Europe. I think that's come to the case. As you properly said, this is not easy for the Germans because they're dominant, but they don't want to be dominating. And so this is where European structures work in. What I was telling some members of the U.S. Congress when this was just sort of starting a week or two ago was Germany would be key because of Germany's weight and influence in the EU, because of its economic interests. So if it, took, it was willing to take uh, some stands against those economic interests, that would be significant. Because of the chancellor's standing and because, frankly, the chancellor's personal experience, including with Putin in the East, and she has a sense of what the KGB and the other life was about. So... I, I think, again, as a matter, if I were in U.S. foreign policy, a key piece of my part would be working with Germany on this. And we'll see, given the nature of the debate that the ministers has talked about, I was, like others, struck by Chancellor Merkel's statements, but as we've discussed here, words and action are two different things, and that would also be a comment on U.S. policy. President Elvis, do you want to add one last thing here? Uh, two things. Um, one is that, uh, actually, the other thing I would suggest is uh, using the extremely effective money laundering legislation that exists in the United States, which were which legislation passed in response to Al-Qaeda, but I know that banks had to really jump hoops to prove that they were clean. Uh, and now, if you look at all of the money, I mean, there's being laundered, that it, I mean, to be sort of I think money laundering in Europe has, has also had an effect, at least in one or two countries, in terms of the economic crisis they've had there, looking at foreign deposits. I think if we apply that kind of money laundering legislation, you'd A, find a lot of interesting things. You'd also find out that certain governments were looking through their fingers, uh, violating their own laws. When it comes to leadership in the EU, I would frankly say, especially after, I mean, from 2008 on, I think that I'm not really expecting much in the way of anyone taking a leadership in, in foreign policy just because the interests are so divergent, and this week proved it again. On the other hand, there are issues where Europe, uh, which have nothing to do with foreign policy, where a, an absence of leadership is leading Europe to really fall behind. I mean, one of my favorite areas, which, I mean, the, digi the single market is, does not allow anything when it comes to digital, anything digital, uh, which means we have 28 separate markets, and there has been no movement towards uh, bringing uh, IT, digital services, into the single market, which sounds like a very specific thing, but this is, this is huge. This, I mean, the, the biggest growth in the United States is in the digital area. We cannot have that in Europe because there's no one in the commission except for poor Neely Cruz who's been trying to push this but is overruled. I mean, until we have a vision that we want to live in the 21st century, um, I mean, that's doable with leadership. Uh, the single market was created through leadership, and uh, I personally, or Estonia, I don't think will even support any presidential candidate that does not explicitly say they're going to work on, the, on bringing digital into the single market, um, which is, so, I mean, that's, areas like that require real leadership in the, in the EU, and it has, it's not a matter of like, you know, do you like Russia or not? I mean, that's ultimately irrelevant to what the EU is about. Peter, just, uh, I'm sorry, but one more point I want to come back to on Ukraine. And that is, when we're talking about leadership, all of what we've been talking about will ultimately depend on leadership in Ukraine. Okay, I mean, it, it, all of us can say we want to do this, this, economically, security terms, but uh, frankly, this is ultimately a question for Ukrainians. But it is an issue of how Europe and the United States might mediate, support, bring these groups together. And, you know, I just can't underscore enough that this is, this is one heck of a challenge because the people in the streets kind of lost faith with people across the political spectrum. And you've now got 
people trying to piece this together, and ultimately that's going to determine how all this works out. Let me wrap this up. I have, I have one more rather lighthearted, I think they call it a tag cloud or a word cloud or something like that uh, that, that we're going to close out on to try to bring some levity to a rather serious <laughs> session here. Can I get that up there? Um, who among Europe's current political classes is best suited to lead this transition. We're talking about leadership. It doesn't have to be anyone in this room. Um, we got about 30 seconds. One name, the last name only, if you could type it into your device. And we got 30 seconds starting now. While we're doing that, I'd like to say one thing since I saw Craig is back in the room. I didn't get a chance to say anything before because he wasn't here. But I, I would also like to uh, show my appreciation for Craig's work, and I would also point out, I hope he writes his memoir soon, because the amount of stuff he has done behind the scenes regarding all kinds of big problems in Europe and in the transatlantic area is simply amazing, but he doesn't do press releases on it. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's right. His name didn't pop up after that. I think the, 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 the most, the most uh, for, the, for, the, for the man in the room is, is Carl Bildt, so I think you are our new, our new leader. Uh, congratulations. Anyway, please thank our panel. Um, it was really very stimulating, and I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you.